That's my brother. I ordered to a store in New York City. It's in this shopping park in New York City. You walk in, all of a sudden, it's like a really county kind of truck. So they have to, in a small area, they've got to put everything into it out like this giant Kroger. They have to jam into a small store. So you have these little, like these, these, these little shopping carts that were like flavors you got for your gift. That's what you do, so again, I'm not going into things. And I can't thank you. This one's for grocery store normally. It feels like a big relief. No. I never flew on a soy use, no. Not for real. Only on the big bang theory. Alright, so uh, what I'll talk about tonight is uh, my uh, my space flight that occurred almost five years ago um, to the Hubble Space Telescope in the Hubble Space Hubble Laboratory. Um, it, was a, it was a shuttle mission, as uh, David mentioned. Um, and a, a bit of a
A lot of engineers are also geologists, oceanographers, veterinarians, biologists, all kinds of people who come in. That's fun. Uh, we did a lot of training in a new buoyancy lab, uh, big giant war tent uh, that we have out of NASA Space Center. Uh, because on our flight, we have five space uh, back to back, five days in a row with this kind of space work. So we would have our weeks at the NBL about once a month. <coughs> we would start on Monday, the team from the Goddard Space Flight Center would be on our service team, would fly in over the weekend, get all of our tools ready, uh, and we, we would have that pool for the whole week. We would start on Monday with the first NBA, we each one, and end up on Friday with the fifth one, and those are the great weeks. We did that with five of our trainings about once a month, during our uh, um, great place to go to work. You know, we try to stay suited up and it's going to get cool. Um, this is me training outside of the pool. This is for a repair of an instrument called the Space Shuttle Energy Spectrograph, which is this. In the Generally, what we do on, on the Hubble Space Telescope missions was to replace a big instrument and put a new instrument. In it, regardless of what was wrong with the mission, it just needed to be upgraded or something wasn't working any longer, we take the whole thing out. Kind of like you have a refrigerator and the light bulb goes out, you don't replace the light bulb, the refrigerator is just by local right? Car runs out of gas, why fill it up? Go get another, go get another car. <laughs> something fell in one of the instruments in Hubble, you don't have anywhere to get inside, you just put it in one. So this instrument we did not have a replacement for, and the power supply got fell inside. This was the last uh, servicing mission to Hubble that we were assigned to. So this is the last crack we were going to get at the telescope. So we devised a way, uh, I say we, meaning our crew of health, with uh, teams of engineers from the United States Flight Center and other places around the country to develop techniques and tools and procedures in order to repair this instrument by getting inside of it. This instrument had 117 small screws that this access that keep this access panel on that it would stay in the space shuttle. This is a replacement unit from the second servicing mission. And power supply fell a couple years after that. Uh, in order to get inside, all these screws had to be removed. This access panel had to come off with a round strap gas. This thing was buttoned up so it would never be taken off. It was the shuttle off. As long as everybody messes with it. Now we have to take it off. So we came up with uh, a bunch of new tools, over 100 new tools. The thing I'm holding is this new power tool we designed. It's a high speed, low torque uh, power tool with a light on it so you can see what we were doing inside the telescope. The thing I'm working on it is a faster capture plate that I would take a couple big screws out, put some mounting bolts on there, put this uh, faster capture plate on, and then each one of those holes, I've got this, this tool going, the tool head going through one of the holes on the access hole. There's a screw on the other side. That would come out, everything would be trapped inside of the, the inside of that plexiglass, kind of floating around the screws, the washers, whatever glue was on the threads of those screws that they really didn't want to see in some part. And we would remove all the plan was to remove all those screws, take out that, that, that panel, pull out, remove the board that was also had a couple of screws in there, lock down bolts that had to come out, pull that thing out, put a new card in, and then put a replacement cover, which didn't have all the screws but just latches. And that was what the spacewalk was going to be. What I want to point out on here, you see the gold thing up on the right hand corner? There's another one that looks like that, you can't see it, that's kind of hidden down here. In between, that's a stanchion. In between, on this two over the top, screws were taken out of that already before I could put this thing on. There's a handrail that was there. So while I'm practicing, that handrail now is gone. But I'll show you more about the handrail later. So you can get some trouble. Okay. So we launched uh, May 11th five years ago, it'll be five years coming up. This is Atlantis with Endeavour in the background. This is the first time they ever had two space shuttles ready to go. They canceled uh, the, shuttle, the shuttle servicing mission after the Columbia actions. About a year after the Columbia actions, they made the, the decision was announced by, uh, by NASA that they were canceling the next servicing mission. They had these new instruments that were going to go in, new gyroscopes, new batteries, everything was ready to go. We were starting to plan the mission and they canceled. They said it was too dangerous to send a shuttle to the space station, uh, to, uh, to the hull. We could still send them to the space station because if you dock at the space station, remember how in Columbia was it took debris on the way up, put a hole in its plane. And we developed a technique to be able to inspect the space shuttle with a big inspection boom on the other robot arm. 
if you found any damage, you could try to go out and fix it. Or if you're at the space station, you say, well, you know what? We're not going home on this spaceship. We're going to hang out here for a while. You can last for a very long time on the space on the space station. You have life support there. There's plenty of room. On uh, going to the Hubble, that's a different story. If you find out you have damage, you can't return, you can't fix that damage, you kind of stuck because there's no life support on the Hubble. And you're going to run out of life support on the shuttle in about 17 days. It's going to start to really bad. So they canceled the mission, so it's too dangerous. Uh, but once they started flying the shuttle again and got comfortable with it, Mike Griffin, uh, the NASA administrator, uh, devised a plan, had us devise a plus meeting with NASA, of how we could still do the repair mission. And the way that they got it back on was that if we got stuck, if we were marooned up there with that space shuttle, it was fixed. They had another crew in quarantine, ready to go, to get into this, get into Endeavor and come get us. And we would do a transfer of crew, and that was, that was a rescue one. So the only time that's ever had two space shuttles ready to launch. We were going to go, if we couldn't come back, we were going to send them to our to come get us. Um, they were going to launch today. Uh, I was I, I looking at this, I'm going to let it in leave without me. I'm still saying a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing pretty cool, you, you wake up, uh, you do breakfast together, you put on your fancy space suits, you get up, sit on the, on the van, you go out to the vehicle. My first launch, it was a night launch, and getting out to the space shuttle, uh, there's nobody around on launch day out there because they fuel it a couple hours ahead of time. They clear the area. So at night, it was, it was a little bit scary, actually. You know, it made noise and stuff. I don't know if I can smart thing to do to get inside, but it's not too late. <laughs> uh, this was a day launch. It was still a little scary, but not, not as bad. Um, and this is some video of our launch day. There is a... Here we have yeah, so, what you're seeing is us getting loaded into the shuttle. And then there's some water so you have to cut off. You see that water, that's water coming in there, down into a big trench, into the plane trench, and that's the battle of sound. So the main engine flight, and then six seconds later, the solid right light on the shuttle, and away you go. We did about you know, a couple hundred miles an hour already, just after a couple seconds, going so from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. Um, and there we go. There's like no doubt that you're moving at this point. You know, <laughs> So we had a, a, a couple of alarms go off when we got off the pad. And luckily, there's nothing we had to do because you're, you're moving around quickly and you're under, you know, you're, you're shaking and rolling and you're just kind of running and it's going to work that day. Um,
the belly and the side. We had to do a more inspection than normal because when the shuttle would be approaching the space station to get the images of the bottom of the shuttle, it would be the slip maneuver. They would take the imagery from the station. We didn't have that capability. We had to go off with the robot. So one of the first things we did, we got to work right away once we once we got into orbit was doing the inspection. We did the first day and the second day orbit. And uh, luckily it was pretty good. Uh, this is some uh, footage from our uh, from our rendezvous with the telescope. We did this on our third day in space. Uh, so Scooter, our commander, is down the back of the shuttle, getting us close to our target, which was uh, the hull. And that is a view from the robot arm, the, the end effector, uh, the graphic picture, the grapple uh, end effector at the end. You'll see a graphic picture coming up here in a second. That's it there. So the probe sticking out, so the hand kind of goes over that probe, and then the end effector has these wires in it that snares it, and you've got the telescope. So you're flying in formation 17,500 miles an hour with your target. And uh, screw put us in a position so that you may just have to go straight forward with the robot on the ground. So, so there it is. So that was a that was a big event because we had all these spacewalk plans, and unless we got the telescope, we weren't going to be able to do any spacewalk. So we got the telescope uh, in payload bay, we burned it in the back of the payload bay. Then it was time to get ready to space walk. So on day four of the mission, we started uh, doing those. Uh, John and Drew uh, were the first team out. Mike Good, who's blue shirt behind me, and that's who we helped out with the pants on. Uh, we were there to support those guys, get them into, the, into their suits, to the airlock, do all the depress of the airlock, and then read them the checklist uh, throughout, their, throughout their space walk. And they did the same question anyway. On the first space walk, that's uh, John on the right, and that's Drew, he's on the robot. He always had a free quarter with the guy moving, or the man woman moving on, his, on their own strength. Uh, they just then you have a person on the robot arm uh, moving around on the end of that. Uh, that works pretty well. You have the person on the robot arm can handle these big pieces of, of equipment, and the other the other astronaut can just scatter around with a little bit more uh, uh, agile in what he can do. Uh, and you work in a, in a team, so it's truly out there. So that's a wide field camera uh, coming out of the box and uh, into the telescope. And the old one came out and back, back inside. Wide field camera um, unlocks the secrets of the universe. <laughs> it's a really cool picture. I mean, you really get the, the, the uh, impressive deep images of Hubble. Most of the real beautiful ones that we see come from the wide field camera. The uh, second spacewalk, that's uh, Mike Good upside down, that's me toward the bottom of the picture. Mike is holding in his, uh, in his hands uh, the rate sensing unit. We have three rate sensing units uh, on the telescope. Each rate sensing unit has two gyroscopes in it, and they spin and point the telescope. Uh, the, the, the telescope has these great optics that allow us to see deep into space, but it also can point. Very accurately, so as it's traveling 17,500 miles an hour, it can hold its gaze on its target, on whatever, whatever it wants to look at, whatever it's looking at, and hold that gaze and adjust itself so it can get that image moving that quickly uh, because of these gyroscopes. The accuracy of the point of the telescope is if you were on the Empire State Building in New York City uh, and about 250 miles away on the Washington Monument, you're holding up a dime, you can hit that dime with a laser. From the Empire State Building, you get the accuracy of the point, the point of the accuracy that the telescope has. So it's this, uh, <coughs> it's this great engineering miracle to tell us what it's capable of doing in space. So we replaced those gyroscopes on the second spacewalk. On right, the third spacewalk, um, some of you might be old enough to remember when Hubble was first launched in 1990, it didn't see very well. It had an aberration with lens and its lens, and the images were coming back pretty cloudy. Uh, so what they did on the first service mission two years after they launched our Hubble, they put this silver-looking instrument into the telescope. They took out one of the sizes. This is about the size of a telephone booth or a refrigerator. These are axial instruments. There's four of those instruments in the telescope. You can see the one there came out, and then there's one on the right. There's two more on the other side. Those are, those are axial instruments. 
wide field camera is like the size of any branch now. That's a ring or two, they said a little bit higher up in the telescope. But anyway, what they did is they sacrificed a science instrument. They put CoStar in. And what CoStar did was deploy a series of lenses uh, into the light path of the telescope. And read them to light, just like you use glasses that you can wear glasses here in the, in the audience. What the glasses do is they bend the light so that it hits your eyeball in the right spot. That's your eyeball. It focuses the light directly so you can see clearly. That's exactly what they did with the public. They put these lenses, these corrective lenses, into the light path to read them to light. It's better than the instrument for them to see correctly. CoStar, the name of the instrument, you can see the name of the kind of sideways, is uh, corrective optics. Space telescope actually replaces it. That was the whole purpose was to read them the light. When they put new instruments in the telescope, they already had the correction in there. So after all the after the core servicing mission, all the all the instruments had been replaced with the correction already in there. So we were able to take Cold Star out. They didn't need it anymore. We put a few signs in the side. Not regarding the stuff that went inside. So space <laughs> number four. Uh, was the repair of the space telescope and the spectrograph uh, that, I, that I showed you. Uh, we'll, we'll see some tape from that of what happened, but I had some trouble with that handrail. Um, one thing I want to point out here is you can see to the left, there's a planet tonight, which I our planet. And it, it's dark to the left, a little bit of blue, and then really bright. So you're dipping around a planet every 90 minutes, so you get 45 minutes of Daylight followed by 45 minutes of darkness for us. 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets in a 24 hour period. And uh, when you're out there, the thing that, that struck me when I first went out to space for the very first time was how clear everything looked. You know, you're in a, in a vacuum and you've got this really bright light. The brightness of the sun above the atmosphere in a space but it's not filtered through any window. The brightest white I've ever experienced. It's more than just white, it's like a purity. Of light comes in. Everything is just really bright. And there's warmth. You know, if you have a thermometer, you can stick it far enough out away from the shuttle. The shuttle kind of modulates the temperature. Um, when you get the away, away, you're at sunlight, you're going on the degrees. As soon as you enter the darkness, the sun's gone. And it's like the, the absence of light. You go from this pure white light and you're completely gone in the darkness. This is complete, complete to, to, to avoid light. Um, and then it gets cold, and so then you can feel the temperature change. But what's, what's happening is you, as you experience it or over a few orbits, you can start to anticipate it coming. And you can actually, in this case, say we're, we're going from darkness into light, you'll start feeling the warmth of the sun before you can see it. You'll feel that heat. It's kind of like being in the ocean, you might get a, a cold current or a warm current. You kind of feel it down in the bone, sort of, you know. And you look, and sure enough, you'll see the, the lit part of the earth coming. And you're hanging into it. So what's really cool is that line. I mean, all the kids. But what happened was this line between day and night. As you, you as you feel it, you turn and you, you can take a break from what you're doing. And you look and see this during the spacewalk. You see this line tracking on the earth. And what it is is the spin of your what you're doing. So we think of a sunrise, the sun coming up and out around. Really, what's happening, of course, is where we're zooming around the, the sun, and our Earth is moving. And you can see, you experience the sunrise and sunset on the, on the ground every day of your life. And I went over with notice that I was the other notes, and it's all dark now. But there, you experience on a whole different level. If you're watching down, looking down, you, know, you see that Earth spin, and that line is moving across the Earth. And you can say, well, okay, it's dark now in Southern California. And it's looking, you know, it's turning and you see that, that light starts illuminating Southern California. So the sun is now gone and it's getting ready. Now there's the sunlight. You're watching this thing. Holy cow, what am I looking at? And you're watching this, this ballet that's been played out for a long time, millions of years, <laughs> four and a half billion years. And now you're, you're watching it from a different perspective. It is just unbelievable. And then you come back to work. Um, this is from our fifth state walk. Uh, it was a radio instrument transfer with a, 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 a fine diamond sensor. You see it's kind of sticking out on the right side there. Uh, you see uh, two of course, the feet up in the air. And I got some of them. That was a 
authenticity and authenticity files as well. Um, this is uh, this is some video. So from this is my helmet camera moving around the telescope. Uh, this is spacewalk video that I've shown you. Uh, this is from when we uh, put in the gyroscope on the sec on second day. That's me inside. That's coming from my group's helmet camera. So I, I, the idea was uh, Mike would loosen the bolts. I would come do these connectors. I would hand him the old gyroscope, and then he would see the new gyroscope. He had, he had a special tool to do that with, kind of like a kid's solar fix stick. It was kind of like a little mechanical crane thing. So, so uh, it worked. It was working well that day, so Mike, Mike was happy to do it. <laughs> and I'm now on my back room on the left, too. That's some better. So that was from uh, from the change of the gyro. And now we also changed out some batteries on the flight. Those are that's a slight like battery module. It has three batteries inside of there. Uh, the battery these are so these are like the regular double A batteries that you get in the house. These are big units. Uh, this is some footage from the fourth space walk where I started having trouble with that hand drill. So we had practiced for years and developed all these tools and we had practiced constantly. What happened was, is I had trouble with a bolt on the right hand side on the bottom that wouldn't come off. I had to get the handrail out of the way in order to get inside the telescope. And uh, it was a strip, a strip bolt. So my buddy just said that that's our handrail. So they, they, the plan after about an hour and a half was just see if I could rip it off. So I threw all this fancy stuff that was
you can send a rocket motor up there to guide it back in. The rocket has range, it'll come down to guide it. So look at that about 30 years. <laughs> um, but it'll, you know, it'll guide it as it breaks up in the atmosphere and lands somewhere. Uh, we think we won't, we won't be able to cover it. And that's how we're ready to do its thing. The aperture door in the front of it is open, and you can see an antenna on the top before the high beam antenna. And it works at the top. We also have some fun stuff. This is my friend Drew Poitro working through a, 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 a lot of water. Um, my favorite thing to do, once, especially once we got rid of the telescope, we have some extra days in orbit. I just enjoy looking out the window. My favorite thing to do. This is uh, some footage we see uh, the effect on air <laughs> on space. And uh, this is a little bit about eating in space. So Megan is opening up her locker and it's got her meals uh, there. It's just different MSQ meals. And so she can open up a drawer and it's got all this stuff that she needs. And she's going to show you the package of food she's going to warm up. So if we heard that, it's going to be all that she's going to eat. And you can see my friend making a tortilla here. This is what it's for.
we just say you're going to give them some, some sugar salt, which in pilot is going to be a little high, a little low, a little fast, a little slow. You're the man. I'm just telling you what you're saying. <laughs> I'm asking Scooter about, uh, about what, uh, what he's going to be doing that day. And it's a big day. So, landing day is a big day for the commanders of the shuttle. Because they're, they get only the Joe Auto Land system on the shuttle. It was all a manual landing. And uh, they had, he, I'm asking about the general, it's like 3,000 guys in a shuttle training aircraft. So, this one approach is going to do the shuttle. So, you launch shuttles into space, you can't like practice landing from the like, aircraft. So, we have modified aircraft that they practice approaches with. And, uh, and that's definitely ready to do the one big approach on the uh, landing day. And the back that part, that thing is like kind of a hot thing. That, that's the tail. It's not on fire. It's just the uh, plasma around the tail is just burning red hot in 2003. Um, there's our gear. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we did not, the weather was bad at the Kennedy Space Center, which was great because we gave it some extra days on orbit. And uh, but the weather was so bad uh, on a third wave off day, so they, they decided to just have us come back to the Air Force. So uh, there was still, there were another uh, ten flights or so after ours uh, in the shuttle program. We were one twenty five. Uh, we ended up one thirty five. So this was uh, you know, towards the end of the shuttle program, uh, five years. Ago. Tool that we had was, was a long tool, about this long, about a foot long, 
the Uber Phoenix ring had a ground strap on a grounding wire. So if we got that, that panel up, I was just swing back, and Mike Good had to reach in with his with his tool to clip this wire. So he didn't want him sticking his hand inside of the instrument. Uh, so he needed something that was long. The blade, because we're astronauts, we didn't want us to poke ourselves with scissors. <laughs> so the blade worked this way. So it had like you know a piece, a hard piece here, and then the blade would travel just like this when he pulled the trigger. Right? So this is a one-of-a-kind cutting tool, or at least you know, what I know to it before was made for space flight. They had to be formed behind Sandra Bullock's head in the movie. So I was looking at Sandra Bullock. I was looking at my tool here. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
we were among my old place to be your friends, which was probably really repurposed for the Nancy people who buy satellites. Basically, we got this brilliant theory that did that. Um, and yet what happened when we took lower, when they grabbed the limbs, instead of trying to make the person to the like the person from Hubble, they ran into the first five satellites, which was about 100 miles. And that's what the problem is. Tiny, tiny little, you know, pure glare. Um, but that's what the problem is, and that's why there's something that should be very little for us. Yes, no, maybe. Do I want to answer? Now you tell them. <laughs> so the story we got was that uh, the uh, the machine that they used to um, calibrate the lens okay, uh, was off. Like there was a problem with that machine that they discovered later. So that the calibration tool they were using to grind the mirror was off, and so that's where we got the aberration. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really sure I answered your question, except that I don't know if you're saying that you did that on purpose or a uh, oh, mistake. It was a mistake. The program was loading the wrong thing for this purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, correctly, the spot that. Oh, I don't know. I know. They, 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 the, the story we got was that it was a problem with the calibration machine. And, and uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but that's the, the story we got. But whatever, it, it didn't work right. They had to fix it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the James Webb telescope? You know, it's only going to replace all this. Going to be enough. So just think about it. We're all going to replace the ground-based telescope. Right? The ground-based telescope. We still got those working really well. Right? So I, I would more of the James Webb is another is kind of a follow-up, the next generation. Of, of telescopes, the next generation of space telescopes. I think we're going to, they're still going to be using Hubble as long as it's I think it's, I think it's great. I hope it works. Uh, it, it, it better not have, whatever that problem is, you better pull that one in. <laughs> if this thing has a bad, if this thing has a bad one, you're not going to be able to get to it. So, uh, it's not, it doesn't have service to the So, they launch it, they better get it right. So, uh, that's, that's that. You know, the only thing about this is not just that they had a problem with the mirror and they were able to fix it. Things wear out. They were, they, you're also able to put newer technology. So think about your your cameras, your digital cameras, and how the pixels have increased over the years and over the time. The technology in, in, uh, in imagery has, has really progressed over just the last couple of years. The other line compared to 25 years ago when we were before Hubble was born. Hubble was built back you know, in the in the 80s, people who want like 1986 version of something like that. Maybe even before then, and then it was it got delayed after the challenge until 1990. But think about how much technology has improved, particularly in the imagery uh, field. Right? So not only were we able to fix things that were broken, we could also upgrade this technology. So I think that's you know, that's the only thing with the, the web is that something something's wrong with it, we're not gonna be able to fix it, and we're not gonna be able to keep updating the technology. But I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be great. I look forward to when we get back. Can you uh, comment on the physical pain that you asked me before? Can you do any of the that makes you laugh? Like the, like, uh, like working out and that stuff? Yeah, so what did you do like two minutes? Um, you know, 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 so the uh, it's it's always good to be in the best shape you can in general in life, but particularly for a snake's life. But uh, so in our mission, two two weeks, if you didn't do very much in space, you know, it wouldn't be that great. But so we you know you exercise every day, even when because it makes you feel better when you exercise anyway. But it's really a problem when you're going to be there for a few months. Right? And my friends are up on the space station right now, for example. With their six month stay on the space station, if they do nothing, uh, they're going to lose bone and muscle, like big time. They're going to lose bone and, and muscle loss. It's going to be a lot of muscle loss and decay that they won't be able to get back when they get back to Earth. So, uh, this, is, this is an issue. So, we, we found that uh, by doing lots of exercise and being in good shape before you go, so you have to start on the ground and get yourself nice and strong. When you get to space, they're exercising six days a week for an exercise period of two hours. And that's not two hours of exercise all the time. That includes uh, you know, changing your clothes, your workout clothes, and turning on the machine and doing all that. 
and then clean up afterwards. So that's two out of three days is exercise six days a week. And they do a variety of exercises. They have a they have a treadmill they can run, which is good because it gives a little bit of little resistance on your you know, on your legs. You you're buttoning down to it. Um, it's good also for your nerve neurovestibular system because it just gets things shaking and moving and, and that and it, it, it's just it's good for cardiovascular, it's good all the way around. And you ride a bike, which is doesn't give you all those benefits, but it gives you the cardiovascular part of it. And then we have uh, a resistive exercise device where they can do squats and upper body exercises which just work on a series of springs and a thermal band kind of thing where you can get a really good workout in there. You can do lower body and upper body muscle workout. And so through these things, plus they've gotten some uh, drugs that can help them, some medicine that can help with some toxic growth and that medicine that, that can help as well. Uh, and now they find crews coming back with no ball loss. Um, so if you look at a woman, we have the problem with, but it's requiring two hours of exercise to in order to get there. So that's that's what we have to do to, to, to stay in good enough shape so that you don't have a significant decay in your bone mass and muscle density. Okay. Uh, it would be nice if there were other accountabilities for people that other other people have to do, but that's where we're going now. So, you know, um, that equipment takes up a lot of room. I got my PhD, I got rejected again in 2000. So I 
the other one now. And then I took a job in Dallas Douglas working at the Delta Space Center. I got to know some of the people around there, was working on space shuttle displays, I was researching them, having fun. I put in another application. This was a short class that ended up being what's supposed to be 94 to be 95. I got an interview. So now you get a couple thousand applications in there, and then you get a little down to a few hundred that you get references on, and then you interview about 100 people. So I got that interview, they get to know you really well, and I didn't tell them that well. So I waited two more years, I applied, actually wasn't as cute as I was doing. The 94 came to 95, that's the end of the process. And I got an interview about this. So uh, I think there's a couple things. One is, is that um, you should definitely fill out an application. Because then I'm going to come knocking on your door. <laughs> right? We did this thing, I don't know, we feel like they had a shortage of applications, but Somebody, I think, up in Washington got the bright idea that it would look like we have a better labor market than, than we normally do. We have lots of astronaut applications. So it became like almost like a telephone. Apply to be an astronaut. We were doing these public service announcements. And they just wanted the applications to get, you know, real, let's get ready we can. This is good. But generally, people are going to knock on your door. Hey, we need some more So you may have to pull out the application. Okay? Um, so that's one thing to do. The other thing is that when you fill out that application, People are going to read that application. Amongst those people are going to be asking. So this thing comes in, your application gets sent over to $2,000. Okay? So you all come in, deadline hits, bang, no more. We're going to review the ones that be out. You usually get about six or seven thousand, whether or not they're okay? Those are going to be reviewed for whether or not the people meet the minimum requirements by our human resources people. Minimum requirements look on all bachelor's degree in science or engineering or something like this. You can also have a doctor's degree, you have experience. There's all these mumbo jumbo kind of combinations of stuff. You look online with all the safety you're wrong. You don't trust me. He told me to know. Look online to find your So somebody screens those things, and that usually eliminates maybe out of say the 6,000 now down to 5,000. Most people who submit applications are qualified. My board, you look at this, you look at this. Mm -hmm. This is going to be long story. Mm -hmm. Then they get to us, okay? And they divide it into nine categories, I think. No, look on the website. So it's like engineering, test pilot, medical, earth sciences, whatever it might be. It doesn't say how these categories. So I, I was in the general engineering category, and I was an applicant, and, and, the, and I was in, as a reviewer, I was in the, the, the general engineering category. So I had me and my friend Bob Benton, another astronaut, the two of us were on the same review team. They gave us like in the alphabet from F to S or whatever it was. They said, you guys look at these 600 and give us the you know, the, the top 60 or the top 10% of what we we'll get represented on. Because NASA has learned its lessons of just sending the astronauts off to do stuff on their own, what would happen? They give us an adult supervisor. Yeah. And there's a third person. So, three, is that third person in our case? It's like Bobby Watkins, who's like the assistant district director of the Marshall Space Club. So, he would come in from our store and look at these outfits, and we would get together and review who we liked and we didn't like. And well, we liked everybody, so who we thought were the top 10 percent, more or less, and then we turned those things over. So, the reason I'm telling you that story is that it's going to be someone like me, maybe that's reading your application. You know, it's not going to be Albert Einstein, or make it readable. Okay, make mm -hmm. it so so we can understand what it is you did. Okay, you know, try to make it so it, it, it's still but it's also going to be something in your field, probably. So, if you're a medical doctor, you think about medical doctor stuff, and it's probably going to be medical doctors that are going to review it. If you're an engineer, tell me engineers are doing Try to make it, you guys will be seeing many of these things. Try to you know, get to the point where, hey, this is what this is what I did. Don't be shy on the things you accomplished. Don't be shy on your awards or any of that stuff. Try to make it readable. Because that's we're gonna have we're not gonna have a lot of we're gonna look at everybody's application, we're gonna read every word. And we've got a lot of these to look at to sort that stuff. So you just keep that in mind when you write it. That's where you want to end up in that pile that we're reviewing. And then we go out to the references. So make sure you have good references on there. That people are going to actually take the time to write a letter. So, you know, people that are, are going to, they may have, how do I say this? You know, they're going to have to fill out stuff. Yeah. So make sure whoever you put down as a reference is someone that's going to fill out stuff and take the time that knows that this is something you want to do. You're not applying to, I don't want to give an example, a job that maybe doesn't really require attention. This requires attention. So these people have to fill out those applications, those references for you. You know, your life is in your hands. That's why I talk about the other one of these stuff. And you submit that stuff, and then, uh, you know, you hopefully get the whole time interview. Okay, that's
that's the application process. So a lot of the application being that stuff, but as far as what you're going to make from your career with Drew, it includes a lot. I'm trying to give a little example of a oceanographer. My friend Drew was a geologist working for Exxon here in Houston as a field geologist, you know, figuring out how to find oil and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it really doesn't matter that much. If you have a connection to the space program, that's a good thing because you can understand that if that's what you're interested in. But if you're interested in doing something else, do that. You know, don't make a decision based on the astronaut. It's not like you can't become an astronaut and follow something that you really enjoy. And then that's going to give you, I think, the best shot at becoming an astronaut. Don't make this as a job. And then the other, the other thing is, you know, you've got to put down hobbies or something you're interested in doing. That's good. So yeah, that's a good thing for them, too. You can have, have that going. All this combined, you're trying to get, you're trying to show who you are to the to the people who are looking at the application, and getting to do, they want to know who you are. There are a lot of people, there are thousands and thousands of people, much smarter than me and a lot of my friends, who never got this, because it's not always the smartest people, obviously. That gets, that gets it. A lot of it is, you know, how you get along, um, is this the kind of person I want to, I told you about the whole family thing at the beginning, right? Is this the person I want to hang out with? You know, this might be the smartest, most brilliant person ever, but am I going to trust him with my life? Am I just who I want to go to space with? You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, show your show yourself for who you are as best you can, and, and try to be positive about it, and don't give up. Get a rejection, just be positive. So, as long as anyway. Uh, uh, um, well, you said that one of the things you really liked was the takeoff and all the power. Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, since the, uh, the Apollo, the Saturn V, there's a lot more power. Obviously, yeah. You get all the way to the moon. Yeah. 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 I don't know, I'd like to find out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that was, that was going to be even better than the trip. Yeah, going all that way through. That's really cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think I was going to go like that. And I think going to the moon would have been cool. But, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got to go like this. Does anyone here, uh, last year, about a year ago, we got out of the evening? You went to the not very many guys that got to walk on Only 12 people got to walk on But yeah, I think we're right on seven and five. If I was given a choice, I would go on seven and five. <laughs> but I'm happy I got to go on the show. I'm wondering if um, between you or your college who spent months and months in space on vacation, mm -hmm. Did you find it annoying when you came back that you couldn't simply pick up a grand piano anymore? <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Uh, you know, you go through a bit of an adjustment. Things don't flow like they used to. And uh, I was having, uh, right after was my first flight, the steward was on with my commander for both my flights. And we're really good friends. We were having lunch. The day we landed, and we, the first time we landed in Florida. Uh, and so we went to crew quarters. Our families were there. And we were having lunch with our wives. And he, he just takes his, his, uh, his drink, he drinks like this, he goes like this, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that was a